Hello and welcome to our Wednesday night Bible study here at the West Main Church of Christ in Tupelo, Mississippi. We're continuing our study tonight of the afterlife and what heaven is going to be like and what we should expect. And we've discussed a great many things. But tonight we're going to discuss actually the question, what will heaven be like? And of course, as we've said throughout this study, we have to acknowledge the fact that scripture is somewhat vague on all of these questions. And I think the reason for that was not God intending to quote, leave us in the dark, but rather because I'm not sure that our human minds in this, in this material realm or sphere of existence in which we live, that we can fully fathom what eternity will be like. So he gives us little pictures and people often envision, and you see all sorts of kind of media references to this. I remember when I was a boy, I'd watch cartoons and heaven was always depicted as clouds and angels always had wings and were flying around and people in heaven would be like angels and they'd be playing harps and you know you have the little devil on one for one shoulder and the little angel on the other and they're both whispering in a person's ear and you get all of these kind of interesting uh, imaginations about what heaven will be like. But the Bible gives us some hints, and we don't make definitive statements on these things because they, we have to kind of use our imagination to fully even have any semblance of comprehension. But it does give us some hints that sometimes line up with our preconceived notions, and sometimes they don't. You know, people have an idea that heaven will maybe literally be streets of gold or some clouds everywhere or choirs singing or other dreams of an of a eternity lavishing in their favorite activities. Well, we haven't been given, as we said, a crystal clear description, but we have been provided with these hints. So let's look at them, first of all. First of all, we see in Scripture just the plain flat out statement, no vagueness involved, that it will be absolutely glorious. So it's something that the Bible tells us, even though we can't fully envision it, God who made us, who knows us better than we know ourselves, he has promised that we will love it. It'll be glorious. Over in Revelation 22, one through eight, John writes, and he showed me a pure river of water of life, crystal clear as crystal and proceeding from the throne of God and the Lamb. In the middle of the street and on either side of the river, there was the tree of life, which bore 12 fruits, each tree yielding its fruit each month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations, and there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and the servant shall serve him. They shall see his face, and he, his name shall be on their foreheads, they shall be no more night there. They need no lamp nor light from the sun, for the Lord God has given them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. Then he said to me, These words are faithful and true, and the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show his servants the things which must shortly take place. Behold, I'm coming quickly. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. Now I, John, saw and heard these things, and when I saw and heard, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel who showed me these things. So he describes for us what is clearly a glorious existence. The language is, is plainly figurative, no doubt, but it plainly portrays the awesome paradise that heaven is going to be. Well, then we look in John chapter 14. John 14, verses 1 through 4, where Jesus says this. He says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. For in my Father's house are many mansions. And if it were not so, I would have told you. But I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come to you again and receive you unto myself. And where I am, there you may be also, and where I go you know, and the way you know. So Jesus says there's going to be a place in heaven that is specially planned for each and every one of us. That, you know, we have our own room, 
And I think that's a beautiful homecoming concept. And we still have our son Seth went off to college and he spends most of his time there. But when he comes home, we still have his room. And it's got his stuff and his bed. And he knows to come home even though he's not there right now. He knows that home, that room is there waiting for him at his home where he belongs. And that's what the Bible is describing. He's, Jesus says, I go to prepare a room for you, a place for you. It's a place where you belong, that you will truly be coming home. Therefore, it's going to be an eternity where we know that we're in the place that God intends, that we dwell in the household of our God and eternally enjoy our birthright as his children. So it will be a place that is truly, truly glorious. Secondly, we see that in heaven, as we asked, what are we going to do forever? I mean, forever. Well, the answer is we will continue to grow. Now, I don't know exactly what this looks like. I can't tell you that um, this is specifically what you'll be doing and this is what you won't, because like we said, all of the language is somewhat vague. But although we know we were going to know more when we're there, of course, we will never be God. You're not God. I'm not God. The angels aren't God. And we're never going to be. That means we'll not be ever be all knowing, but we can be more knowing than we are. We can continue to be enlightened. And the scriptures kind of give us this indication. Look in 1 Corinthians 13, 12. For now we see in a mirror dimly. But then we will see face to face. For now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I am known. So Paul is indicating that when we reach glory, we're going to be informed of things. We're going to continue to stretch our knowledge and to grow. And then in 1 Peter 1.12, it says, To them it was revealed, not to to themselves, but to us, they were ministering the things which now have been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things which the angels desire to look into. So Peter says there are even things on this earth happening now that the angels are intrigued by because they didn't know it. And they've been with God in a heavenly abode. They've been in his presence and they don't just have instant knowledge. So we'll have the opportunity to continue to grow. Could there be responsibilities in heaven? Could we have things that God asks of us, things that we can do to bring more fulfillment to our eternal, our eternal existence? Well, would that detract from paradise? Well, we look in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 15. Where it says, of course, this is the Garden of Eden, which is an antitype, the original predecessor of what heaven will be. And it says, then the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to tend it and to keep it. Well, in essence, Adam, he had a job. He had a responsibility in the garden. Did that make it any less paradise? No, I would say it probably made it more because he had a purpose. He had something to fulfill. Well, we don't know exactly what we'll have to fulfill in heaven. Did Adam's responsibility make Eden less than a paradise? It didn't. But yet it tells us in Revelation chapter 22 and verse 3, And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. Well, what is that? That's a responsibility. I don't know exactly what that'll look like. I don't know how we'll serve him. I don't know if we'll serve him by by just worship or by tending the grounds in heaven or by fulfilling other responsibilities. But whatever it is, it will not detract from the glory of the place. It'll only add to it and help to provide our eternal contentment, purpose, and meaning. We also learn in Scripture that it will be a place of real meaningful fellowship. In Revelation 19, 1 through 8, it says, After these things I heard a loud voice and a great multitude in heaven saying, Alleluia! Salvation and glory and honor and power belong to the Lord our God, for true and righteous are his judgments, because he has judged the great harlot who corrupted the earth from her fornication. And he has avenged 
on her the blood of his servants shed by her. And they said, Alleluia, her smoke rises up forever and ever. And the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God on the throne, saying, Amen, Alleluia. Then a voice came from the throne saying, Praise God, all of you and his servants and all who fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude and the sound of many waters and the sound of mighty thundering saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory for the marriage of the lamb has come and his wife has been made herself ready. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. So here it talks about how in heaven he hears this great multitude and there is a worship of joy and that fellowship that togetherness he makes great effort to talk about the great multitude the group that is worshiping God together just not not just individually but as one body it will never be a burden but the sweet thanksgiving of our hearts as we're a people who worship in fellowship with one another and in fellowship with our Lord God so these passages give us truly a limited picture of what heaven will be like. In fact, it is probably beyond our ability fully to process all of these texts. They do have a lot of vagueness. We can't pin down exactly what it's going to look like or be like. But just imagine the most perfect environment possible. And then one thing is for sure. After you get that in your mind, the most perfect environment, if you were to describe for yourself what, what an absolute paradise would be for you, heaven will be better than that. Isn't it glorious that we get to go there together? I hope you're doing well. We, of course, hope that you're staying happy and you're staying safe and above all, you're staying healthy. And we want you to know if you need anything, reach out to us, myself or Nathan or the elders here at the West Main Church. We'll try to be there for you. Take care and God bless.